The North Atlantic War by Michael Trella Operation Stepping Stone Political Turmoil The six o'clock news was generally the same every night. Most of the stories discussed normally consisted of a celebrity and his or her latest work, some famous person's sex scandal, a pregnant teen's tragic story, or the ever-growing threat of that new and powerful terrorist army in the Middle East, the Global Freedom Army. Aside from the GFA, the evening news channels were basically brimful of people and their desperate attempts at drawing attention to themselves. On Thursday, May 1st, it all changed. As Mary Lou McKinley sat down and turned on the television to catch up with whatever was going on with the rest of humanity, her blood froze as she read the report headline that traversed the bottom of the screen. UK and Denmark unexpectedly invade Iceland. Jim, you may want to take a look at this. Chancellor McKinley was quick to arrive in the room, the sound of his wife's voice not to be ignored under any circumstances. What is it, dear? he asked as he entered. He then took one look at the television and shook his head. This all but confirms the report I received from the War Department. You already knew of this? his wife asked in surprise. McKinley looked at her and nodded. Yes. Both General Seth and General Ironside came to me and delivered the report personally. They're insane, she replied. Iceland is a member of the United Nations and had nothing to do with this stupid war. Not only that, but they're virtually defenseless. Why would they do such a thing? I think you've just answered your own question. As Mrs. McKinley gazed at her husband in astonishment, it was as if a visible shadow crossed over his face as the words left his lips. Great Britain and Denmark are over 2,000 miles away and they need to cross the Arctic Ocean in order to get here. Iceland, on the other hand, is only 756 miles away. Strike bombers could make that trip and back, no problem. His wife's eyes widened with, the, with realization as his point came across. Also, he continued, as you said, they have nothing to do with this war, and, being a member of the United Nations, they had already refused to lend aid from the start. Since, again as you said, they are virtually defenseless, they became an easy target for the Brits and Danes to establish a foothold and build a forward base closer to us. So they decided to use Iceland as a stepping stone to keep themselves close. She shut off the TV and lay back on her pillow. Those poor people, they don't deserve this. The cell was a gloomy place. The walls were cold and moldy, the air dank, and the floor nearly always damp. It was lonely, too. The cell door was made of thick steel, with only a small section cut out and barred to check on him. There was a small window on the opposite wall above his bed, but it was too high to look out of, and only let in a fraction of light. The prisoner himself was still wearing the same clothes he'd worn the day he was cast into the cell months before. Suit, tie, dress shoes, and all. By now, of course, they were tattered and drab, but they were his only option. His light brown hair was grown past his ears now, and scraggly whiskers patched his face. This is no way to treat an ally's ambassador, he brooded angrily. Why am I stuck here? Why did this happen? How could this happen? Overcome by his frustration, Timothy Anderson slammed his fist onto the door. Darn you, Danes! You're nothing but animals! He continued to pound his fist on the door until his knuckles began to bleed. He slumped back onto the hard, cold bed, panting and beating with sweat. Done with your tantrum? The voice was loaded with cynicism, pompous and arrogant. Anderson looked up into the familiar eyes of the guard. However, this time, Anderson noticed another guard with him, one with a little more humanity in his expression. If not, I can bring you your supper later. The very mention of supper made the ex-ambassador's stomach grumble, since, after all, food was given in meager amounts in the prison. I believe I've gotten it out of my system, thanks, he replied with as much suave as possible. After all, he was a representative of the United Kingdom and had to bear himself as such. My, my, is it really at that time of day already? The guard's lip curled in frustration, disappointed that even after months in captivity, Anderson had yet to snap. Dang, 
but he's got stronger will than we thought. Then here you go, he barked, opening the door and sliding a plate of dank potatoes and a cup of tea. Enjoy it while you can, Ambassador. With that, he took his leave, adding a maleficent chuckle as he strutted down the hall. The Ambassador sighed and picked up the plate and teacup. However, he noticed that this time the guard had neglected to add a fork or spoon with which to eat. In fact, there wasn't even a teaspoon for the tea. Anderson was offended. A metal clang caught his attention. He looked up, and there stood the other guard who had come with his usual tormentor, gazing at him through the tiny window in the door. Anderson was nearly shocked by the look of genuine pity in the man's bright green eyes. I, I figured that the warden would neglect to bring these to you. He looked cautio cautiously both ways and removed a napkin. Holding it through the barred window, he let it fall to the ground and turned away. I'm sure they'll let you out soon, he added over his shoulder. Then he was gone, off down the hall to catch up with the warden. Anderson got up slowly and retrieved the napkin. As he picked it up, he noticed that something was wrapped up within it. He unraveled it, and a smile crossed his worn features. Within the napkin, the guard had stowed a fork and a teaspoon. Van Housen read the report three times over, ensuring that he hadn't missed anything. He looked up at his secretary. You are sure that this is accurate? The woman swallowed. Yes, my premier. I have no reason to doubt the reality of his contents. Van Housen continued to look at her, alternating his gaze between the tablet he held in his hand and the secretary's eyes. He could see the sweat making her brow shine in the light. Nervousness defines her all around. Suddenly, an amused smile creased his countenance, and he laughed. Ho oh, ho! Then I guess everything is going as planned. Our ships are refueling at Iceland ports, our planes are hangered in Iceland airstrips, and our men are resting and enjoying themselves in the Iceland towns. With good weather and rest as soldiers, we should be ready for another strike at the enemy within a week. The secretary nodded, taking the tablet back and clutching it close to her chest. Again, nervous. Miss Poulsen, is something on your mind? The premier could see a flash of emotion in her eyes at the, at the question, though what emotion that was, he was unsure. Something that I should know about, or concerns me? That flash of emotion again. Only this time, Van Housen knew exactly which it was. It was fear. The door suddenly burst open, and in flew a man dressed in the black uniform of the party. It was the party's delegate to the UN Embassy in Denmark. My premier, we have an emergency, he puffed. The United Nations has called for an emergency meeting, and there's talk that they'll boycott us. The premier stood up in astonishment. That's madness. We've been members ever since the blasted organization's conception. They can't just boycott us like we're some Central African nation that's barely invented the wheel. What have our representatives done about this? They basically made the same points you have, and the UN's response was, albeit paraphrased, something along the lines of, well, Iceland is a member just as much as you are, and you just wanted to invade them like some Central African nation that's barely invented the wheel. Van Housen's face went red with rage. The bastards! He roared, slamming his fist onto his desk and knocking over the pencil cup he kept on the right side. That's a major dilemma indeed. It gets worse, my premier. I've heard rumors that they even plan on sending us an ultimatum to evacuate Iceland. What? The Danish premier looked about to have an apoplexy, the veins in his forehead creating an intricately grotesque pattern similar to some occult tattoo. He took several deep breaths, harnessing all his willpower to keep his collar in check. After a few seconds, he unclenched his fists and released a prolonged exhale. Well then, I suppose it's time to play our trump card. He couldn't help but smile at the irony of the joke he just spoke. The official before him nodded. The intercepted transmission? The very same. I want it brought before the other representatives at the emergency assembly. With the correct choice of words and playing on their emotions, it should be enough to placate the United Nations for now. 
But sir, what if they boycott us from the meeting? Then make sure that they don't, damn it! We are going to be present at the assembly, and we will win the United Nations over, lest all our efforts be in vain. The man straightened up and saluted. Yes, my premier. I shall ensure that we carry out your will at once. Fenhausen smiled. Excellent. You're dismissed. As the door shut behind the delegate, the sound made the premier realize that he'd heard it while discussing the UN crisis with the party delegate. The thought bothered him to no end, but he couldn't pinpoint why. Then the realization hit him. The secretary, he thought aloud. Upon observing the room, she was nowhere to be seen. She'd used the heat of the moment to slip away. Clever girl, that one is, he thought. Still, this was the confirmation of his suspicions. He picked up his hotline to his security. Captain Van Housen here. We have a guard set up at 9 o'clock sharp. I'm going out tonight. The streets of New York City were as busy as always. The air was thick with exhaust fumes, tobacco smoke, and the occasional atrocious stench of burning marijuana. However, the traffic was most severe around the United Nations headquarters building, though the reason for it having been built in the middle of New York continues to elude scholars to this day. The news had reported speculation that the representatives from the different nations would be holding an extempore meeting to discuss urgent matters, and had even warned that such an event would increase city traffic by 35%. Nevertheless, despite all this, the city's inhabitants paid little heed to the warnings. Now, they were paying the price. Businesses would peg May 5th of 2042 as late day for years to come. And yet, even the commotion caused by New York City traffic during rush hour on late day paled in comparison to the havoc that was being wrought by the world's delegates to the United Nations during that infamous emergency meeting. It's unthinkable, the chief Icelandic delegate ranted. You are waging war with the North Atlantic Republic, are you not? Then why in the world did you invade us? Why? We are peaceful, had nothing to do with your senseless conflict, and now our capital is destroyed, our people in camps and our resources exploited. He pointed directly at the black-dressed man on the other side of the hall, casting a murderous glare at the red armband he wore. You are a monster! You and your confounded premier. Order! Order! bellowed Secretary General Ignatius Hearthcliffe. His wrinkled brow was the worst any had ever seen it, while his white hair was seeming even thinner on this particular occasion. Despite his age, his voice was still an ear-catching baritone. The irate ambassador from Iceland restrained himself from further ravings and took his seat, tears glinting at the edges of his eyes. You greatly overextended your time to state your complaints. Nevertheless, your concerns are well-founded. Indeed, the recent and unexpected invasion of Iceland is our chief concern at the moment. He turned his attention to the black-clothed man who had been the object of the Icelanders' disdain. How can you explain your nation's actions, Mr. Holm? The Danish ambassador rose from his seat and straightened his coat. Honorable delegates from across the world, you are here because you have heard that we, in our endeavor to take back what is rightfully ours and put the Greenland rebels back in their proper place under our wing, we have gone and done something despicable, invaded a non-combatant. The delegates present began nodding, shaking their heads and whispering to each other. You have heard, he continued, that we sent our forces en masse to an unprotected, unsuspecting nation, and conquered them for apparently no good reason at all. He paused, assessing the audience's reaction. Is this not what you have been told? The delegates began nodding and whispering again. Perfect. Then let me begin by saying this. There is a vital piece of information that none but our brothers and sisters from the United Kingdom know of. The murmuring stopped dumbfounded men and women looking confusedly at one another. Holm then reached into his pocket and drew forth a small envelope bearing the seal of the Icelandic government. I have here a copy of an encoded transmission which was sent from the Icelandic government to Greenland. A message which, when decoded, 
reveals itself to be a pledge of assistance to the Greenlanders' cause in the war. The assembled ambassadors gasped in disbelief and horror. The Icelandic delegates all stood up at once. This is preposterous! How dare you accuse us of such ludicrous actions so shamelessly? Holmes stared directly at them. Show the message on the screen. The projected image of the United Nations on the wall flickered and was replaced by an enlarged image of the message which he held. It seemed to read like nonsense, normal letters jumbled together with unintelligible symbols. How does this prove anything? asked one of the delegates. Despite his serious facade, Holm couldn't help but laugh internally. Oh, how glad I am to have given up acting for a career in politics. Playing to live crowds is so much more fun. Now, show the decoded message. The screen flickered again, and the image that replaced it shocked all in the room, save the British and Danes. There, in clear black and white, was a message clearly stating that Iceland was, according to an alliance formed apparently six months prior to the declaration of war, committing themselves to providing supplies and land for bases to the Republic. To top it all off, it bore the signatures of the Icelandic Prime Minister and the Secretary of Defense. The room was silent. This... this can't be... one of the Icelanders managed to exhale. Now Ambassador Holm was smiling openly, the thrill of his successful act too much to hide any longer. Is this not what you have received as well, honored delegates from the United Kingdom? The chief British ambassador rose and solemnly nodded his head. It is. What the spokesman from Denmark has said is completely accurate according to our experiences as well. The room began to buzz with apprehension. None of them had expected this. They didn't know what to say, think, or do. Holmes saw his chance. They were in the palm of his hand. Now was his time to clinch it. Honored members of the United Nations, you have gathered under the influence of a lie. Under the pretense of innocence, Iceland has accused us of invading non-combatants in an attempt to stop us from regaining that which is rightfully ours, and buying themselves and the Greenlanders time to mobilize. This mass deception cannot be tolerated. He pointed directly at the delegates from Iceland. It is you who are the monsters here. Order! Once again, the room went silent at Hearthcliffe's behest. I must say that this information does indeed throw a wrench into things. Have you anything to say about this? The entire assembly turned to the Iceland delegation. They were speechless, with only a scattered, It's a lie, and we're innocent to be heard. Well then, the Secretary General said, we shall take all this under consideration. For the time being, no action shall be taken against any nation involved in the conflict until further notice. I pronounce this meeting adjourned. Holmes smiled triumphantly as he watched the room empty of its gloomy inhabitants. Switching from acting to politics was the best choice of my life, he mused. I mean, it's not like I do things much differently. The streets of Copenhagen were particularly gloomy at night. Due to the economic strains caused by the war effort and the times preceding the communist rise to power, the lamps were all on their lowest brightness. Few people ventured outdoors once the sun went down, as police patrols stalked the alleyways and stood guard at street corners. This didn't stop a young woman from taking the risk. Darting from shadow to shadow, she skirted the edges of the buildings as quickly and stealthily as possible. Occasionally, she could have sworn that a patrol had seen her, only releasing her breath when the guards turned around and continued their routes. Eventually, she came across a manhole with the lid left slightly ajar. She bent over and began to lift it aside. The sound of heavy metal grating on concrete seemed to be audible for kilometers around. She hesitated, looking all about her to ensure that she hadn't been noticed. Seeing that she was still alone, she kept hauling the cap aside until it was barely wide enough for her to squeeze through. Suddenly, she froze. Footsteps, and they were close. She didn't have much time. 
She quickly squeezed through the gap and slammed the lid shut, not caring about the noise it made so, so long as she was out of sight. Her bare feet had difficulty gripping the slimy ladder pegs, causing her to nearly slip off several times. Thankfully, the descent wasn't a very long one. Once she reached the bottom, she waded through the ankle-deep water, picking out a very particular path through the city sewer network until she reached a solid iron door with the viewport at eye level. Without knocking, the port slid aside, though no face could be seen on the other side. Secretary, reporting in, she whispered. The port slid shut. A lock turned. The door creaked open. Enter, agent of the greater good. Once the door slammed shut behind them, a figure emerged from the shadows, dressed in overalls and a steelworker's shirt. Monica Poulsen, he said. I'm glad you made it. The meeting is about to start. He led her around a corner and threw yet another door into a room lit by a can fire placed in the middle. Several dozen people stood around it, shadows dancing across their faces cast by the firelight. She recognized a few, but most of them were strangers to her. It didn't matter, though. They were united in their cause. That was enough. One of those present stepped forward, a man in his mid-forties with the chiseled features of a veteran. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we are here with unity of purpose. Our country is on the brink of destruction from within, as corruption and deceit fester within our government itself. The communists have done nothing but bring about our great nation's demise. We are gathered here because we see this. We are gathered here because we must end it. To do this, we must strike the corruption at its roots. Our target is Premier Van Housen. The others nodded in assent. It had to be done. The man motioned for Monica Poulsen to step forward. Agent Secretary here comes into direct contact with the Premier on a regular basis. She knows his habits and weaknesses better than any of us. Her knowledge is indispensable for our cause. She stepped forward next to the fire and took a look around the room. All eyes were upon her, eyes filled with hope, hatred for the communists, and the desire to repair what they had destroyed. She herself felt the same thing. She opened her mouth to speak. Asking Miss Poulsen is a safe method of gathering information, I'll grant you that. The room froze. The voice came from beyond the light of the fire. But if it's information about Premier Van Housen which you seek, a figure began to take shape out of the darkness, slowly walking toward the fire, taking its place where the secretary had been standing. Why don't you just ask me yourself? Horrified gasps emitted from the throats of half of those gathered as Premier Van Housen stepped into the light, clad in the Communist Party's uniform, a wicked smile on his face. Impossible! How did you get here? Miss Poulsen asked. Yeah! How the heck did you find us? asked another. The premier let out a slight chuckle. My dear secretary here never empties her purse until she arrives at her home. I simply had one of my men stick a tracking device in it before you left. The woman gazed at him in a confused, terrified manner. Oh, you're wondering how I knew all this? It's rather simple, really. I've had my men spying on you ever since you gave me word that Iceland fell. He raised his right hand. Speaking of my men... With a snap of his fingers, the door to the room was blown off its hinges, and whole squads of the Communist Party's private police force came storming in. The meeting's participants were completely surrounded and held at gunpoint before they had even thought of resisting. You are all accused of high treason against the state of the People's Republic of Denmark, plotting assassination, and breaking the evening curfew set by the law of the state. You're a monster, Van Housen, the veteran member growled. The premier smiled simply in return. Guilty. The soldiers raised their weapons. Treason is among the most serious crimes, ladies and gentlemen. A capital crime, as a matter of fact. He stepped back from the circle of conspirators and allowed his troops to close the gap. And capital crime can only be paid for through capital punishment. 
The people looked up at him in terror and hatred. So this is how it ends, one of the group said. At least the world will know we tried. The world will never know you existed, the premier retorted. He then turned to the captain of the troops. Dispose of them. For the next agonizing ten minutes, the roar of automatic gunfire mingled with the death screams of the conspirators could be heard all throughout the streets of Copenhagen. Thus, the conspiracy to assassinate Van Housen and free Denmark from under his thumb was thwarted by none other than Van Housen himself. Six solemn figures stood around the table in the center of the War Department's primary strategy room. Five of them bore the uniforms and badges of high-ranking military officers, while one simply wore a black suit with a red, white, and blue striped tie. He was the highest ranking among them. Gentlemen, Chancellor McKinley said, we have convened here to discuss our next move concerning the war for our freedom. Our enemies have shown us that they are not out of this fight yet, and have chosen to go so far as to break the policies of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and invade a fellow member state so as to gain a foothold for forward bases closer to us. Iceland, General Chalana breathed. Heartless scum, added Patton through clenched teeth. They will pay for this. I agree, put in Ironside. The aggressor's most recent actions have gone too far now. Invading us was bad enough, but invading a non-combatant just to stay close is unacceptable. A general nodding of heads went about the room. Then it sounds to me like we have an idea about what our next objective is in this war, McKinley said with a satisfied smile. Ironic, isn't it? Patton mused aloud. Indeed, said General Seth. Our next move is clear. We invade Iceland ourselves and drive the British and Danes out. <laughs>